Hi folks, today I have Matt Gilbert here from Manty Games. He's come to visit today and we'll have a bit of a chat and catch up. And um, so I thought what we'd do is we'll start Matt with a little bit of a chat about, about you, how you okay. started with Manty and when that in your background, and then we'll move on and we'll have a bit of a chat about what's coming out now and maybe some few if you've got some secrets for us. Sounds good. So yeah, let me know about you then. Uh well I guess my my wargaming journey started with fighting fantasy game books, where I, you know, so I think it was my aunt brought me um, a couple of Scorpion Swamp was one, and um, they kind of sat on the shelf for a little while until I eventually picked them up. And, wow, mind blown. <laughs> um, and then from there, you know, it's through Hero Quest, Space Crusade, you, know, you yeah. see the stuff on the adverts, those classic adverts on the TV, <laughs> fall in love. Um, and then I remember when I was, well, I was 27. Uh, getting Warhammer third edition the yeah. book they brought out so that was my my Christmas present probably the best Christmas present ever <laughs> uh, reading through that started collecting White Dwarf um, and yeah it started from there really so fantasy is my first love yeah um, which is uh, and hopefully you can see that in Kings of War uh, coming through um, but uh, yeah they went through there went off of when I went to university kind of stopped really playing actually fell in worked for GW um, oh, okay. for um, as a, just a key timer while I was yeah. at uni in my second year um, just in the store down in Brighton fell in with the crowd there um, they actually left started their own game um, game shop um, drifted away from workshops I started playing lots of card games dice games um, space combat game Silent Death which I don't know if anyone remembers uh, a lot of Battletech loads of Battletech oh, we played right. Uh, and eventually drifted back, so got back into 40k in third edition. Played 40k for a long time, yeah. and then was running 40k events and BattleTech events. So. Uh, and then uh, we decided to get back into fantasy again. Tried fantasy battle at the time, um, but then found this little game called uh, Kings of War, which <laughs> came out just on a pamphlet. Um, and uh, yeah, went from there. Really fell in love with that game um, and just how easy it was. Um, and uh, collecting the models and stuff like that. And at the time, I was mixing a bit of Mantic, a bit of uh, GW, stuff of eBay, that sort of thing. Yeah. Some of my old collections. Um, but yeah, just went from there. Became a Pathfinder for Mantic. Yeah. Um, stuck my oar in and uh, <laughs> eventually managed to get a job. <laughs> so I guess for those that don't know, Pathfinder is essentially a volunteer program type thing. Is it like sort of being the... The sort of the person who shouts about it or champions the game in a store type thing. Yeah, exactly. So I was I would go off on some weekends, you know, maybe to a, a bowl competition to show Dreadball off, or yeah. I'd go to a, a store opening, or they were just taking the Mantic range, and I'd go along and I'd demo games and, and yeah. etc. Or we'd help out at things like Salute. Yeah. And we still got that program now. Yeah, it's obviously a lot more Pathfinders than there were. Of course, yeah. Back then, but I myself and uh, Stuart Gibbs. Uh, Stuart got a job with Matic first and became the studio manager. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And then uh, he's left and now I've, I'm the studio manager. So. <laughs> so how long have you been studio manager now then? Um, I started to take over probably three, three, three and a half years ago. Yeah. Um, and there was a little bit of crossover as Stuart was leaving and I was I was taking over. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, probably at least, at least three years. So... Enlighten me, then. What what is a studio manager, and what's your responsibility? I mean, I, I guess it's pretty much a bit of everything, but <laughs> it's pretty much everything. Yeah. So uh, you know, it's starting from you know from when we're early planning. Yeah. In, in terms of budgets, mm -hmm. so how much are we going to spend on tooling? How much are we going to spend on art, writing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we do do a lot of uh, freelancing out. So you know, we're, we're not a very big team. My studio is myself. Um, we've got uh, Dave, who's our sculpt manager, yeah. 3D printing, and um, etc. Got uh, uh, Ben, who does all of our photos and a bit of our layout, um, and I've got Duncan, who graphic designs, who does all. That. So that that's the team. Yeah. Um, so we've got no artists, we've got no painters or anything like that. So all of that goes goes out externally. So obviously, I have to plan for that in terms of budget and stuff. And yeah. that will be for every game system. And what art are we going to get done? Um, and uh, on the Kickstarters, we. Well, yeah, know. but you've got to plan. You're planning all of that twelve to eighteen months out. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and I'm not sure if kind of people realise just how how much goes into stuff before anybody even finds out that that stuff's like even happening, as opposed to as coming out. Like even when people start to feel like uh, I sort of hear the news about things being teased and stuff. What's that kind of timeline in, in a kind of a, a rough? I mean, I think 
in terms of you know when when a version of a game drops, I'm already starting to think about what the next version could be. Yeah. Like what 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 could I not get in in that timeline? What as we've gone through the playtesting process, what do I want to release for that game? Is that going to be an expansion? Is that am I holding over that to the, the next uh, edition? So yeah. I'm already thinking about uh, the rain, uh, ranges, um, plastics, and game design three to four years out at least. Yeah. In terms of actual planning, I think the fastest one we probably did was Armada. Yeah. Um, that was, I think we had a sales conference in about the November, December, uh, so about 11, 11 months before it came out. Yeah. But the reason we were able to do that so fast is because it was a game that Warlord had already written, because yeah. we based it off of Black Seas, and Gabriel came in to the sales conference one evening and showed us the game. And as usual, I was just yeah. sitting there in my head playing it and rewriting it in my head. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll change that, change that. Um, and we did in-house resin, so we didn't yeah. do any plastics. So there was no tooling to do in China. You know, you're not having to cut cut yeah. steel and make molds or, or anything like that, and then ship it back. Um, so we were able to do that in the time time scales. And considering we also did that over lockdown, yeah, when no one was available to play test or anything like that, yeah. it was you know it was a challenge. But we, we managed to do it. But normally it's twelve months plus yeah. that, we're, that we're planning stuff. So. I, was, I was going to say, like, even even with a game where you you're controlling and manufacture yourself in house. You've already got the rules, maybe sort of two thirds of the way there, if you like, of what you want. There's still twelve months ahead, basically. So yes. things don't like kind of like just turn around overnight. No, absolutely. You know, so I'm, I've already got, as I said, I've got, I've got for Kings of War, I've got a plastics plan up until 2025, uh, alongside releases and storylines and, and yeah. you know, mashing all that together, um, and uh, you know, and I'll be planning to do that work uh, twelve to eighteen months in advance. Yeah. Because obviously I need to put the sculpting time in. Since it's there, you need to get it into China, which is where we get all our tooling done. Um, and then you've got three to four months while those tools are being made. It comes back, you get test shots, saying, hang on, no, there's a sinkhole here, you know, yeah. seeing all the teeth off of this bit or whatever <laughs> it is, or, or what have you done there? Um, and then it's got to be manufactured, and then it's got to get to you. And then on, alongside that, obviously, you've got all your painting to do. It's a new army or something like that. Yeah. You've got all of that work to do as well. So the, the 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 project timelines for every for everything on our release schedule, yeah. you know, is 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 way way back. And if it's certainly if it's something in China, then I'm sculpting. You know, my my delivery might be here. Sculpting's way back here uh, for plastic, but the resin stuff's here. But then it all needs to tie up painting yeah. to be photographed to go on packaging, and it's it's, it's a lot. I think many moving parts yeah. across multiple projects. I was just going to say, I think a lot of that gets gets kind of missed in general by the you know people like me who just want to go to the shop and just buy some new toys kind of thing. The fact that it's already a complicated process, but you you juggle in this with different games as well. So obviously, like sort of Dead Zones is the new thing that's coming out at the minute. Um, we just had Overdrive not too uh, not too long ago. We've got sort of new Kings of War releases. It's a constant sort of thing, and and I guess you're you're putting a pin in a in a calendar, saying that's that's the release window. But there's so many moving parts that can shift. Well, that's that. it. I mean, I, I can look at any one week and take a slice, you know, in my team meeting and say, okay, we need to sculpt it, start sculpting those things. Those two yeah. things should be in in packaging and layout those two things should be in photography yeah. these two things should be in concept you know and even down to the on the manufacturing process you know the molds the test molds should have been made for these and, and that's that's every week they can slice through all of those projects running that way taking slices through that way and saying what we're doing and that's my team of four, <laughs> five with ricky who does all the on the resin cast because i guess there's, there's also kind of like a, an assumption that mandic is this is this huge kind of corporation type thing now and and I've been fortunate enough to kind of sort of to be to be at Mantic a few times now down at HQ and meet the team and yourself, um, and and to me it se- it seems obvious that there's there's sort of a smaller team doing lots and lots of work, but I guess that's not the necessarily the the, the outward sort of viewpoint. No, if you I like, I think it's a perception that we're a lot bigger than we, than yeah. we are. I think we're up to. 28, 29 people yeah. you know, between here and the guys we've got in the US as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, the US presence is um, got one full time, two part time. Yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, um, we've got, we've, we've just, when, when we came, when it came to Armada, we realised that we were going to need to step up the resin. Yeah. So we, we switched from a, the, the resin we were using before, we had a 45 minute set, mm-hmm. um, and we weren't obviously doing that many kits. We've obviously stepped up the amount of resin that we had to do, certainly for Armada, is suddenly, you know, for what we were doing, maybe, say, in hundreds of units a week, yeah. suddenly tens, tens of thousands. <laughs> what would we do? So we got some new equipment, new in, a resin injection machine stuff, but the, the resin we use now sets in two minutes. 
So you've got, oh, wow. you, you've got a hammock. Once you start, you carry on going. <laughs> so you've got teams that are, that are injecting, demolding, and bagging stuff, you know, constant cycle, really, yeah. really quick. So we had to step that up, but we're putting a lot more into resin to make up, you know, to, yeah. to make up for it. So, I hadn't realised yeah, that the setting time was so fast now because like, yeah. my my experience is kind of from the last time I think I looked in the resin room was kind of like yeah it was a, it was a, a bit of a longer set time stuff yeah well and, and of course it was they were mixing it by mixing it by hand and then they could pour it in and they got yeah. time to to take you know to put it in the vacuum chamber and, and take all the air yeah. out now they're still doing that but yeah it's two minutes but the gun that they've got mix it takes from the two barrels just feeds yeah. in mixes it as it goes so they're oh, injecting inject okay. inject inject you fill your mould up gas it yeah. straight to stripping. I can feel a visit to come down and see that. I want, I want to see how that happens now. Because I think the other side, and I think it's probably kind of universally accepted now as well, is that um, Mantix resins are really, really sort of like the quality's first class. It's, it's up there with as good as any, any resins that anybody's making. And I think that's kind of testament to the fact that, like, you know, the, the, sculpt, the sculptors that you use are, pu- are putting out some fantastic sculpts. The staff that you're using are making some good stuff. But it's just even now when you're talking about like how fast that's going through in the numbers, I think that's. Well, I think uh, that's down to uh, that's. So we've got uh, Luigi who does most of our sculpting, um, and then Ricky who is our master mold maker. So yeah. he he understands what it, how to cut models up, where how to how to position them, how to feed into them, yeah. um, and all of that stuff. Um, and uh, we get between him and between him and Luigi and Dave, our sculpt manager. Every week they'll meet up and go anything that Luigi sculpted. They'll they'll, they'll look at it on screen and Ricky will say no, you can't do that. You can't do that. you know tweak that, edit that, and then cut it here, 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 here. And part of the the process, even when Luigi's finished sculpting it, is to go back through again and then it will get cut up yeah. for the casting. And that that casting cutting process is different to the plastic one because the plastic one we give to the factory and they work out how to. Yeah. You touched on kind of plastics coming from China and stuff there. Now, obviously, I'm sure everyone's aware. You know, we've we've, <laughs> we've had we've had a few issues globally, haven't we, with with shipping and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and obviously, factories closing down through the pandemic and stuff. What's the kind of the the not one effect that's had to you in your role and, and Manic as a company? I said the no- normal timeline for some for some plastic. I mean, we'll so to say something. Let's pick something like a uh, the Goblin Frame. Yeah, we, we did uh, did uh, one of the recent ones. That's probably. Six to eight weeks of Luigi's time yeah. to actually sculpt all the bits, um, and then we'll send all of those bits to the uh, to the factory, and we'll say this is what this is this is the maximum size of frame that we want um, to fit in our boxes and things like that. Yeah. Here's all the components. If you can't fit all the components on, then drop these ones. So here's an A. Here's an ideal A. Here's a B. It's really bad. Here's a C. <laughs> Um, and they will charge. Obviously, there's a set cost for the for the size of the tool and things like that. But then they charge per component. So the more components we try and stuff in it, the more they'll charge. Okay. It's more than to cut. Yeah, of course. Um, so something like a, a battle zone tool like this is a lot cheaper than something like a goblin frame because a goblin Lots frame, of little bits. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Got arms and heads, pouches, all sorts yeah. of stuff. Um, so once once they've accepted it, they've quoted it. We've accepted the quote. Well, argued with them. <laughs> uh, from there to them coming, you know, they'll they'll send us a tool layout. They'll, they'll say, "Hang on, no, you've changed. You know, you've changed that. You can't change that. Take that back or twist it this way, and then that might work." Yeah. You know, so there's a there's a bit bit, bit to and fro. But from them, from agreeing the the quote to us seeing the first kind of test shots yeah. through is about three months. Okay. Um, and then you've probably got four to six weeks of um, adjustment. There'll be uh, sinkholes or something like that. Or they haven't fed something properly. Yeah. Uh, or they have done something ridiculous where, you know, or something's just stretched the detail. Especially, <laughs> you often get it down the sides of models because you've got your two molds coming in, you know, like yeah. that. It's down the sides that get that lose oh, okay. the detail. Yeah. So if you've, got, if you've got too much detail down the sides or it's too fat, you'll lose. Um, or, it's or, science or, it's, or it gets stretched it? out. Yeah. So you often see spikes and things on the on the fronts and the backs. But if spikes down the side, will often get, get stretched like that because you can't... You can't once the mold's in, you know, if it if there's it, it is any um, it's kind of it would be an undercut, but from around the yeah. sides, obviously the mold isn't going to part again or shatter the plastic. So you know that's all the stuff you have to think about. Um, so then, once we've agreed and it's approved, um, it's obviously then got to be production uh, line. So we'll order, you know, it's five thousand, ten thousand of that, of that yeah. frame, um, and injection molded plastics quick to do, but obviously they've. You know, they have, to, they have to book it into their production line, yeah. so it could be probably four to six weeks before that order's ready, and then it's on a boat. Normally, that's five to six weeks from from China. 
but at the moment we've had shipments that are up to two, three months late arriving. Just left on time, yeah. but then it's just sitting in this port or it's sitting in that port. And we have had factories close as well, it, just randomly. So the, the, either a port will close because of because of COVID yeah. or, uh, or a factory will shut or you'll order something, it'll be timed exactly when there's a, a, a Chinese holiday and they'll just shut down for yeah. a week. Um, and then that not that has an effects as well. Never guarantee it, but at the moment it's it's all over the place. I guess until it's in your warehouse, like anything can happen, can't yeah, it? Because can't even getting it to the UK doesn't mean you're going to get your hands on it yet with customs and everything else that's going on. And I mean, yeah, yeah, we've had stuff sit like in Felixstowe or in uh, Southampton or whatever for for weeks and not be released because they can't process it yeah. fast enough. Either they haven't got the lorry drivers, yeah. Or, they, yeah, or customs can't do it. They just haven't got the staff. Or there's such a backlog that you know, yeah. they just they just can't work through. So yeah, it could be we could we could know it's in the UK, but actually <laughs> you just can't get you your hands on it. it. Wow. Yeah. And is, is that is that having a knock on effect now for future projects? I, I get. I mean, it has to, I suppose, because there's no real kind of like oh, like in a month's time it's going to be fine kind of thing, is there? Uh, it has a little bit in terms of certainly in, in restocks and stuff like that. So you, so people have seen some stuff go uh, out of stock and then come back in again yeah. because suddenly the plastics all arrived. Um, you know, so in in our operations meetings and so it's like, well, we know we can see it on the map where it is on the boat, but yeah. you know, it's just not arriving yet. But some stuff will run out before it comes back in. We haven't got that constant cycle of feeding everyone all the time. Um, and obviously, some you know, when you haven't got plastic, but you have got the resin, then you then actually, actually, well, there's no point making a resin yet because the plastic's not in. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just making mountains of expen- you know, expensive of warehouse space that's yeah. just filling up with plastic. So it's adding a logistics problem in, just in terms of what to make when as well. Just laying everything on. I can't, I can't even get my head around just, how, just how, <laughs> how many plates you're spinning on those kind of stuff. Let's uh, sort of, problems aside then, let's yeah. talk about some positive stuff. Um, we've got Dead Zone uh, uh, 3.0, third edition, whatever you want to call it, is kind of imminent now, I suppose, by the time this video goes up. People yeah. will be starting to kind of at least sort of see things shipping and stuff. Um, how, how was that process for you guys? Uh, that was another one. I think we probably started that one about... F- 15 months early yeah. uh, and again because it was a game that was already already there yeah. and we didn't there was not much to, to do with it there's some there's a over the life of the second edition a lot of uh, there'd been a lot of FAQs and a lot of things and yeah. tweaks and things like that and there was some stuff there's always stuff that you know you, you could clean up and make and make better of course um, so we wanted to wrap all of that uh, in one uh, so I think the biggest thing wasn't the rules it was how do we present Dead Zone because I think with version one and the Kickstarter, there'd been a huge amount of hype. It's the right game for the right time. I don't think it delivered in terms of. I think the, the terrain it did. I think the game was the game was a bit sort of par and a bit complicated. Yeah. Um, and the models weren't great. Um, and then I think in second edition it addressed a lot of the things with the rules, but I think the presentation still wasn't there. So I think mm. Dead Zone is a game that's been waiting to break out because it's so good. Yeah. But hasn't had it, and I think so. One of the things that we I really wanted to tackle with this was how do we present Dead, Dead Zone? Yeah, I've been since since I've taken over. Don't tell Ronnie; he won't watch this. <laughs> I've spent a lot more on art on every project than yeah. we have in have in the past. I tried yeah. not to reuse old stuff either. Yeah, if I do, I reuse it in a different way. So, in the in Kings of War, a lot of the original art was used as like uh, watermarks and, and greystale stuff in the in the corners yeah. and then the new stuff was the stuff you saw in, in colour um, so I, I do reuse old assets in that way because we were not a workshop of I don't course. have a team of yeah, 20 of in-house artists yeah. to do stuff everything's outsourced so I have to budget in advance um, so you know but it was I, th- I think that the, the previous two versions of Dead Zone had presented all of our terrain in a very militaristic Mm. Way it's, it's all you've painted it here, it looks brilliant, but it's everyone paints it grey, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, and look at what we, we looked at it and said, Oh, actually, you know, this it while it looks great, it's kind of it's pigeonholing, yeah, uh, into one particular world, one particular aesthetic, of course, yeah. And what we wanted to do was mix it up and you know, a bit more, a uh, bit more cyberpunk this time. Um, obviously, it appeals to people like the Infinity players and stuff like that, of course, which is great. Yeah. You always want. Something that appeals to multiple people, not just your own go- game systems. Um, but we wanted to, to push the fact that you didn't have to just build these militaristic grey cubes all yeah. the time, and you could you could mix it up, and you could be very clever. So we did one more plastic set, which was some and some signs and stuff yeah. like that, and just that small set, which was just one frame of, of plastic, 
suddenly changes how it how it all looks. Yeah. Um, and I think people have got quite excited about that and have started building even with the existing plastic. Yeah. Quite interesting new uh, new materials, and I've tried to get that across in the art as well. So, in the background section, there's a uh, I think we've done a uh, what a first sphere world looks like, what a second sphere world looks like. Yeah. The kind of the outer sphere worlds look like they get progressively worse. <laughs> um, but we wanted to show what what different worlds look like and what different maybe different alien environments look like yeah. and stuff. And so you, it, it doesn't just have to be this no. this military th- complex that you're building, whether it's ruined or not. It can be anything you like. Yeah. yeah. The the new kind of they, you see the bits of awnings, the kind of like cash machines, that type of stuff. Um, I, I'm in the middle of painting and doing it as, as a video at the minute, um, uh, and they look fantastic they, and they do give a different feel even just in, incorporate it into this. Like, for example, when I started painting this, I had the blue bits on it. But then when I when I kind of brought in that kind of cyberpunk feel, I was like, right, I'm going to get some pink and start to bring it in and kind of add to it and stuff. And as soon as you put those extra bits in, it does have that effect of yeah. kind of changing the feel of it. But well, one, of, one of the things, because I think in the first and second edition, one of the things that was kind of hammered home was that Dead Zone's a whole planet. Yeah. The whole planet gets shut down. And actually, it could, and it was always, it was always, you know, you're kind of several months into this dead zone, mm. everything's really derelict. But actually, you know, a dead zone might have happened last weekend. It might have been declared, and it might have been yeah. declared just in a continent or just in a city. In which case, everything's, you know, everything's still there. There's still all these civilians are still there. You know, like it, you know, people yeah. are still trying to yeah. sell stuff in their shops. It has to like start that. somewhere, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, so we're trying to mix that up as well. I'm not saying dead zone isn't just a, you know, not an entire planet thing, and it's, you know, mm. you. Could have, it could yeah. have just happened. It could be about to happen. It could just be this this uh, you know, metropolis that's just been locked down yeah. before it spread, anything spreads too far. I think it's uh, one thing I'd say from from reading through the rule book and stuff as well is that it gives that feel the extra the extra kind of um, background sort of um, story that's in there as well. Feel of the game. It's just for all the rules haven't changed hugely. The the the, the feel and the kind of the world the game plays in. Just feels different from the way it's presented. So I think it's if that's what you were trying to achieve, it's certainly kind of tick yeah, the box. I, th- I think one of the failings of second edition there was almost no background. Mm. So you could pick the game up, you could get start playing it, you'd be like, "What's the context?" Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it just wasn't there. So I wanted mm. to put a background section back into this um, yeah. and take on our storylines as well. It was an opportunity to take on some of the stuff where the as far as Dead Zone mm. and the expansion books and. Firefight and Warpath, or where they'd all got to, yeah, and then move the storyline on, yeah, you, which is what we're doing with Kings of War as well. We're constantly moving the storyline, either oh. through campaigns or just, yeah, or course, just yeah. anyway. I think it's something that people, everyone appreciates that stuff, but I think they also forget that it takes time, and it's, it's like you, 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 you don't make money by selling kind of background if you like, if you like, you make money by selling kind of miniatures and. One needs to come before the other and stuff, and it all needs to kind of feed on. And the longer these games are around. The more you've got the opportunity to do that, and, and I can see from having sort of version one, version two, and version three rule books now, I can see the progression through that now as well. Yeah, it, it just the, the longer the games are alive, the more or more background you get, and then it just becomes richer and richer and, mm. uh, uh, and richer. Which is, you know, it, it was one of the big things with Kings of War. I wanted to uh, take everything we'd got so far and then almost double it or triple it. Yeah. So you know, one of the you know, I'm ashamedly say it, one of the things I wanted to do with that big rule book. Was the nostalgic feel that I had with Warhammer? It's yeah. like, that's your rule book, you know, and it's it's you know it's well twenty percent of it. Most is rules, and the rest is just your background. You know, and everyone always says they want background, and then nobody reads it. And then if you don't put it in, everyone complains there's no background. So it's this, yeah, it's it's a, it's a cash flow too. So what, what do you do? Do you leave it out? And then no one. But then you get lots of complaints about well, I don't understand yeah. the game in the world I'm playing in. And if you put it in, reads it. Bring if you bring novels out, yeah. nobody reads them. But then if you don't have novels, people say, "Well, where, where's your novels?" It's, you know, it's, it's funny. It's a bit of a double edged sword because what I think what it does, and, it, and you see as well with that kind of the, the big third edition Kings of War book, it feels quality. So like, even if people aren't necessarily reading every single word in there, it it, it just it, it exudes quality. Like it, it, you can see there's love and attention and time has gone into that. It's not just a case of just bang the rules in the book and well, get so it that's out. That's why I think art is so uh, so important. It's, even if you're not reading the words, yeah. you can look at the pictures, yeah. you know, and they'll tell you what the words is. It, it, it instantly saying. kind of Absolutely. sets the scene, doesn't it? Yeah. I guess you were just chatting about Kings of War there as well. There's loads of stuff happening with Kings of War at the moment. We've just got, got my Halfley army, in, which is which yeah. is kind of mid being built at the moment. Um, I, I suppose that's been selling pretty well as well. Like you've been out the stock and back into the stock, and well, that was one of those. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was. I think it was a lot more popular. In fact, the Salamanders were more popular. Than 
expecting yeah. because of course they were an existing hard plastic kit from the forces of nature which we had an army list for um, from the original Uncharted Empires book um, with lots of units that we kind of moved up around the plastic yeah. um, but never really had a release for so we released it um, expected it to do alright but actually way, did way more than forecast our things are the same but of course they got hit with you know the initial lot went out and then we ran out because of we were waiting course. for plastic because yeah, it's sitting on a boat without us coming back in I think it's all gone back out again yeah. probably got instantly used into <laughs> we ordering again but uh, yeah very very popular with the uh, halfling which is good because obviously you invest a lot of time and money into of a plastic course, kit yeah. you need it to sell to make its money back of course yeah well, now something like Kings of War you make that money back over the course of its lifetime over that's four six eight years however long you use that kit for something like a um, game might just be a flash release you need to make that money back straight away yeah uh, which is why tend to do it all games in PVC because the tool is cheaper. Yeah. Hard plastic. Oh, okay. Hard plastic yeah. tool. It's more of a capital investment, so it's to sell more of it. To money yeah. Back. And and I guess it's one of the reasons why so many people use Kickstarter is because that way you're you're almost getting that. You know how many you're going to sell. You're getting that pre-order in advance kind of thing. Yeah, and you've got the quantities that you mm. need to pay back your tool. Yeah. Space. But I think that's kind of as well. You've moved away from Kickstarter for a lot of those plastic releases now, and I think it's. People appreciate it because it, people don't want to wait really kind of 18 months, two years, all of the delays and everything else that comes with that stuff. I think it really is a kind of appreciated that you're, that you're sort of putting your money where your mouth is really when it comes to that. Yeah, I think we're, we're big enough now. We've got a big enough customer base to be confident that we can do, certainly for our own IPs, yeah. like Dead Zone, like, uh, like Kings of War, is to make those investments because it's because they're games that are, that are runners and yeah. people are buying from if we bring new stuff out, people will buy new stuff. So we yeah. can invest in yeah. plastic and stuff. Things that, uh, that will go to Kickstarter when we do like, SSI. Of course, like yeah. That. yeah. Um, Kickstarter because they just, tend to be more splash releases or, of, or just a short tail. Of course, yeah. yeah. Kickstarter still has its place and, and there's definitely places to use it. But I think, um, like you say, when, when you've got a bit more of a stable customer base, you know what seals are going to be. You can estimate seals, I suppose. You don't know what they're going to be, but you can estimate them. And it helps the fact that the stuff that's coming out looks great as well. So... I guess we, now is a good chance to sort of chat about sort of any future stuff. Is there anything coming down the pipeline that you want to kind of tease us with? Uh, yeah, so we've got, um, everyone knows the Clash of Kings book for Kings of Wars coming out. Um, so that's um, be about three, three or four weeks time. Mm. So it went, just went off to print uh, middle of last week. Um, so everyone had their last say on you know, tweaking points <laughs> uh, and, uh, and everything else. Um, and again, and that's, I was telling everyone at the the Clash of Kings so that that was originally going to be um, two books. So I was going to have um, in the summer we were going to have um, Storm in the Shires, which was going to be the Halflings, um, and our new army, which is the Rift Forge Orcs. Yeah. Um, so that that was that was going to be there. But then we, as as we were coming in, and we started seeing all the supply problems and everything else, and all the things we hadn't done last year, and how things were sliding, we decided to move it all to not have not have that Halfling book here and the, um, the Kings War. Uh, King, Clash of Kings book at the end of the year, we just put them all together yeah. in one big book. So it's quite a bumper book. Um, it's, so it's got all of the, the halfling background and stuff in it. Yeah. Um, that was all written by uh, Scott Washburn, who's also written the halfling novel okay. um, as well. So it made sense for him to write the background yeah. as well. So I commissioned him to do that. Uh, it's got all the information about the Rift Forge Orcs. It's got both of their army lists. There's a whole campaign in there about uh, with those two in it. Um, and then a, it's probably... 45% uh, big slug of updates to the game. Yeah. Um, so, so taking third edition, so which was 19, so two yeah. years into it now. Um, and ch- just changing things up, more spells, more uh, the way magic works, how you can buy stuff, more artifacts, changes for every army, bringing back formations. There's, there's loads yeah. of stuff. A big, I'd say shake up, not really, but it's a big, big change to the game. And one of the things I tasked the rules committee with said, you know, in third edition, we probably, probably, while I was focused on how it looked and all that art and all that background and stuff, um, we probably cleaned the game up to a point where it was maybe a little a bit too bland. Yeah. This puts all the fun back in again. Interesting. Um, I think it's going to be uh, a blast for everyone. Oh, fantastic. So that's Kings of War. Anything else for your other ranges? Uh, so Armada, the next ship release for that is the, which people would have seen in the Caesar Flame book. Yeah. Uh, is the Salamander fleet. <clears throat> so they're next. They're about to go off for painting, actually. Um, 
happy to get the sales reprinted because they were they were way too big. Uh, Ricky would have cried if you'd got one sale per mould on it. Uh, so we'll get those reprinted and then they'll go off for um, uh, for that. And then we've we've got um, an early we've still focused on sci-fi uh, in terms of big releases early next year. Obviously, everyone's seen that um, we're play testing Firefight at the minute. So you of course, can imagine yeah. Where we're going next? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. I look forward to seeing what comes down the pipeline for that as well. And I guess Dead Zone sort of getting a resurgence as well and doing well gives you an opportunity to tie some sort of things that you might want to do for Firefight along with things that you want to do for the Dead Zone. Yeah, absolutely, in terms of re- releases as well. So, you know, obviously we're starting to repackage all of the, the Dead Zone stuff and how we want that, that, that structured commercially as well as from a, from a game point of view and how it is make it easier for the customer to, to yeah. buy the, the, the bits and pieces. And that will flow into, yeah, into other ranges right together. As I say, it's all planned so far out. So, and it's all, all, inter- all interlinked. It's all fingers crossed up there. That we kind of, at least that you can plan for stuff. It, yeah. It's one thing things being delayed, but as long as you can plan for it, it kind of at least you, well, yeah. Yeah, you kind, yeah. kind of got something coming. Matt, thank you very much for your time today, mate. We covered loads of stuff there. It was great. And it was really interesting to hear just about some of the things that goes on in the background that people never really get to experience or, or get to hear about. So, and I'm fascinated by the fact that wrestling goes off so fast as well. So, thanks everyone. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks for watching my video. I hope that you really enjoyed it. And if you did, why not consider clicking on the suggested video below to see more of the work that I've done. If you'd like to support the long-term sustainability of this channel, why not consider checking out my Patreon where you can pledge in support from as little as $2 a month and there is lots of different tiers and bonuses which will give you access to a private discord server it will give you free t-shirts free mugs a podcast every month and a number of other things including getting your name at the end of every video like these awesome folks who already support me now